Well, howdy, folks. I'm Hank Sheffer, and I'm here again this day with Mr. Larry Hedrick. Uh, we have another tale for you that I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, but it's not about gold and silver, but you're going to have fun with this one, too. You know, in our travels, we've been to a lot of places and met a lot of people exploring the true to life history and legends and lore here in the mysteries of the Superstition Mountain. We've talked about the native people building extravagant cliff dwellings. We've explored the cause and effects and the travesties caused by the Indian Wars. We've talked about the creation of useful, fertile agrarian land that was produced out of desert areas. We've talked about the building of modern thriving towns and cities where nothing had existed before. And we've talked about the men and women whose vision and entrepreneurship laid the very foundations for what we see in our day-to-day -to -day lives today. And of course, we've talked at length about gold and the many treasures that these old mountains have become famous for. We have seen such a wealth of adventure through our historical storytelling. To me, one of the most amazing accomplishments attributed to this area is the incredible construction of the Mesa Roosevelt Road and of course, the Roosevelt Dam itself. In fact, we even did a video on that that you can go back and see. But with all that said, would you believe that one of the things that has intrigued me as much as anything, and don't think I'm crazy now, but I have to wonder how all these freighters managed to get all that material and the supplies up to the Roosevelt Dam by way of that skinny little road called the Apache Trail using 20 mule teams to pull these huge wagons. I just can't figure out how they did that. Well, I know Larry Hedrick, the co-founder of the Superstition Mount Museum, has been messing around with horses and teams and whatnot for a long time. Can you help me out with that, Larry? Well, you know, my family moved to California when I was three years old, in September of uh, 1941. And uh, my first experience with a horse was right then, where we've got a picture of me and my brothers on a, a little pinto. And, uh, you know, during the war broke out just a couple of months after we got there. And, you know, there were some trigger happy soldiers at that time. There were, there were, uh, spotlights in the air and every time a flame, <laughs> plane flew over the they cut loose and then there was a story about a submarine japanese submarine and all that and my folks put my brother and i on a, bo a, a bus back to oklahoma and um, my grandfather had a an old horse there that he had for years and and that horse was trained to just say, go get the cows, and he wouldn't go get cows. <laughs> my grandpa put me on that horse with no saddle, no reins, and said, hold, hold on to his mane there. And he sent the horse off to get the cows. I didn't have to do anything. I just, you know, and I only say this, not to anything about the expertise of horses and stuff, but as a child, I had no fear of horses. Yeah, well, <clears throat> my real experience didn't happen until I got to Arizona. And that was in the late 50s. And uh, my dad was living in a trailer court down here in Mesa. And a lady there had a horse that she corralled across the street and it needed exercising a lot. And uh, I rode the, the devil out of that horse. And, um, but really, uh, you know, in 75, I met uh, uh, Tom Collinborn, and we started taking trips in the mountains. And if anything will get you seated in a horse and stay on a horse, it's That'll the ups it and downs. Down. And yeah, then there was some pretty dangerous stuff going on there. And and that's where you really get your confidence when you can go in there and come out and, and never have fallen off your horse. <laughs> and uh, I even brought a team of mules. Uh, I only got one picture of that team of mules, but they were big mules. And uh, when I bought them, the, the fella didn't really say much about them except they were broke to ride and broke to pull. 
And I didn't trust them very much, so I had an old Army Jeep. So I rigged up a d double tree and hooked them up to the bumper of that Jeep, and I drove around all over out here. Pulling the Jeep. Pull, yeah, pulling the it. Jeep. <laughs> and uh, of course, he, I could step on the brake and throw it in reverse if I had to. <laughs> Is that like, whoa? <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I bought the mules because I had a, a three-inch ordnance rifle, Civil War cannon, and limber. And I wanted, we were in a lot of parades with the cavalry unit that I developed. And uh, I wanted to be able to pull uh, the cannon in a parade with those mules. But uh, everything worked perfectly on a rubber tired vehicle. But the moment I hooked them up to iron wheels, that one, one mule just Different took off at the, the, the end of the story. And I never did trust that mule to put him in a parade because of that. I'm really intrigued about the cavalry. What was the cavalry thing you mentioned? Well, because of the fact that I had the cannon, some Civil War reenactors contacted me. And uh, when we got involved in the Civil War reenacting, uh, some other guys wanted to make cannons. And I bought some wagons off an Indian reservation in New Mexico for the wheels and axles to make cannon with. And um, uh, after I'd made two or three cannons for other guys, a fellow heard that I had all these wagons. I had 20 of them. <laughs> and that's covered in another episode, by the way. But um, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to make me a deal, and he invited me down to his place, and he opened up this shed. He had 20 McClellan saddles in there. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and uh, bridles and, and everything. And I traded him a saddle and a bridle for a wagon, and that's how the cavalry come into being. And for the next 15 years, we'd done public and non-public reenactments, and uh, that was one of the most interesting hobbies I was ever involved in. It, uh, uh, one time we went with Fort Huachuca over to the Chiricahua Mountains where one of the 5th Cavalry guys or 6th Cavalry guys uh, owned, a, owned a ranch. And uh, <clears throat> if you got captured, you got thrown in the grain bin. And if you didn't get out, you were out of the game for the rest of the <laughs> night. So it, it was a wonderful hobby and I really enjoyed it. In your travels with all the horses and whatnot, did you ever deal with Red Wolverton? Seems like everybody who's ever dealt with a wagon or horses or stunts or anything else has bumped into Red Wolverton at one time or another. Yeah, Red Wolverton was managing Apache land. And you, you of all people ought to know that. But uh, yeah. uh, I got to know Red very well. And uh, in fact, the cavalry was out there a couple of times, and uh, we had a steak fry, and he was running the steak mm -hmm. fry and stuff. And I, I got to know him so well that when one time he uh, was taking his Concord stagecoach and his six-up team to Apache Junction mm -hmm. for to be in the Lost Dutchman parade, and. Uh, I was amazed that he let me drive that uh, six up for a while. You're kidding. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a picture here of how you're supposed to hold the reins. And I just reached around and put my fingers over the reins just like he had his, and he handed them over to me. And he didn't say a thing to me, you know. I did, and uh, driving along on a straightaway, everything was fine till we came to a long sweeping curve. And that's where I made my first mistake. I assumed those horses would naturally follow the road. Oh, 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 oh. Not so, right off into the desert we went. And uh, you know, that's when I learned that uh, when you're driving a six up, it's not like anything else. A uh, two up, four up doesn't compare to a six up. Those horses are trained to respond to those reins, and they're going to do exactly what you tell them. And if you don't tell them, that's so why I ended up in a doing. That's exactly right. And um, uh, I know there's got to be times that you can't tell all the horses to turn at the same time. You've got to turn the leaders first and the swing team second and the wheelers last. And I don't know how you, I, I don't know how you do that with a six up. I can see moving, telling the turn, uh, the, the leaders with the reins or the 
wheel horses with the reins, but every time you do that, the swing team's going to get some motion they too. So I, so I, I just don't, I just don't understand how that's done. And anybody out there in the audience that knows how that's done, we'd appreciate you knowing it. Because listen, I looked it up. I tried everything. I've talked to several people about it, and. Uh, they really didn't have an answer. And they, never, they tell me, I, I asked a couple of people when we were looking for that, they said, I never really gave it any thought. <laughs> well, that doesn't help us at all. <laughs> no. So anyway, you know, Red was interested in buying Apache land. It was up for sale. And every time he went in and tried to make a deal, the price went up. Every time. So he finally got discouraged with that, and he moved to Tucson. And he, he worked with the old Tucson Studios, and still does as far as I know, uh, except I just heard they closed. But um, he knew I had uh, military saddles, he knew I had wagons, he knew I had a cannon, and he arranged to rent all that stuff for the movies when the need, need well, came sure. up. And, and I remember this one specific time, he, you know, the Hubba Bubba Bubble Gum commercials, you remember those? Oh, I sure do. Yeah. Big bubbles, no troubles. <laughs> and so Red rented one of the wagons off of me for one of these Hubba Bubba Bubba com commercials. He also rented saddles for another in which I, my cavalry wasn't involved in, or just the equipment. But on this one particular uh, thing, it called for a, a, a wagon race. And he hooked up two of his horses to my wagon. And uh, they didn't tell me who was supposed to win. You know, it was a race, and there was about 20 wagons and buggies, wagons, all kinds of things involved in this race. And I just turned the horses loose, and man, I, I, be, I beat everybody. Never, never thought a thing about it. Who's supposed to win? <laughs> well, it turned out it was Red's daughter, daughter in another yeah, wagon well, okay. who was supposed to win, <laughs> and we had to reshoot that race. And. Uh, Anyway, uh, as we got to the bottleneck where we were all coming together at the end of the race, uh, I was pulling on the reins to slow the horses down, and they were responding, but very slow. And uh, I didn't know Red was behind me on a horse. And, mm -hmm. and as soon as Red said, whoa, those horses responded immediately. So, you know, they know your voice, I'll tell you, and, and it helps a lot to have uh, for those horses to know verbal commands like that. It's ironic that you mentioned working commercials with Red, and I did too. I actually oh. worked with him, and we used that stagecoach, that big Concord of his, and my partner, Don Plummer at the time, we were all ghosts. The commercial was called Ghosts. And there's a picture, a scene that we shoot where my partner is walking down the boardwalk at Old Tucson down in Mescal. And the stagecoach goes by. And the stagecoach is a ghost too because you can see my partner through the stagecoach. <laughs> but here, here comes Red with that six up and that, that Concord stage and just went right by and it was, it was kind of a, a, a placid moment. It was just ghost on ghost. <laughs> but working with Red was always, okay, well, let's do this. Uh, well, maybe we'll do that. You know, everything was just really relaxed, but he knew what he was doing <laughs> at all times. Well, now that we've talked about all, we've talked about two ups, we've talked about the four ups and the six ups, but getting back to the topic that we started with, are these 20 mule teams. How in the world did they make that happen? How did they make those work? Because they don't have reins on every mule, do they? I mean, they nothing silly like that. Right? How did they do that? I wonder how many of our audience has ever heard the term, I don't know that guy from Adams off ox. <laughs> you know, by the time you get to an off ox, your relatives are pretty distant. But I want to explain that before we start this because it's not really cussing. They think you're cussing, <laughs> but you're not. <laughs> and, you know, you have the near horse and you have the off horse. You have the near mule and you have the off mule. And that's where the word off ox comes from. He's the far one. Because they the riders usually ride the near one. Now, for example, we have a picture here of a Civil War cannon team pulling a cannon with a six up. 
and all the uh, soldiers are riding the near horse, not the off on horse. On the left side. On the left side. And that's important to know because when, when you're dealing with large teams, that's also the case. On a 20 mule team, the driver is usually riding the wheel horse on the near side. And he's controlling everything from that position. Uh, you, your teams are the ones that are hooked right to the wagon. The first team is the wheel team. And these are usually horses, even, even with mule teams. They're, they're bigger, they're stronger. And when you get into like a Silver King mine where you see four wagons and 20 mules, uh, the, the wheel team is the one that's really putting the power into getting that thing moving. Although they're being helped by the other ones, they're the wheel team is the strong team. They're and the low gear getting that's the it. started. And, and uh, that's, that's the one the near one that the, the driver is usually riding. Then you have the swing teams, that's the ones in the middle, and then you have the leaders, the, the two horses, the two mules at the very front of the line, which may be, they're all hooked to the same chain, which may be 150 feet long. And there, how would you do that with reins? You can't have reins to every one of those teams. So there's only one line that goes to the nearsighted, not nearsighted, he can see pretty good, <laughs> the near side um, leader mule. And he, that one line is attached to him. And he's attached to the other leader by a solid line. So whatever he does forces the yeah. other one to do the same thing. But there are no other lines to any other of the teams, of uh, all of them together. They are trained to voice commands, every one of them, which meant the driver had to know the name of every mule to be able to give course. It's Jerry, Jack, yee, ha you know, left or right, you know. And, and um, they had to actually jump the chain when they went around curves. In fact, we have, uh, we have some photographs of uh, a 20 mule team with, with horses as, as the wheel team um, being trained. And there's several people riding alongside them because these are, these are being trained. And there was a tremendous amount of training that had to go into these mules. And uh, some of them, if they didn't work out, they were eliminated from the and new, new ones brought in and trained to, to respond to these voice commands. And our first picture here shows um, the, the first team, although they're all swing teams between the wheels and the leaders, the first team is actually hooked to the tongue of the wagon. And they're called the pointers. And when their names are called out, G or Hall, to, to go left or right, the, the, they have to, one of them has to jump the chain. And that moves the tongue of the wagon, turning the wagon away from the curve. Because if they didn't do that, they would eventually, the wagon would rub up against the side of the turn. And, and depending how steep the turn was, you know, in our second one, we have pictures of two teams jumping over on the, on and the, they're all on the same, side, on of the same side of the deal and, uh, and pulling away from the turn so the wagon doesn't hit the, the sides of the cliff or whatever they're up against. We have a picture here that shows uh, a mule actually jumping the chain. Of course, when the when the curve straightens out, he's got to jump back, and after a while, he, he he may do that on his own. But mostly, they got to be told when to do it. And I'm not sure if the mules knew the driver's name, but, but I did. <laughs> just just like Red, when Red said "Whoa." They, they knew, they knew what they knew his voice, and when that, when the the driver says, "Jerry, G," yeah. you know he knows what to do. This gets pretty complicated for one man to know all these mules, and that, my goodness gracious. Now, and the next picture we got, we found on the internet, was the mules pulling wagons, making a great S turn, and actually this shows swing teams jumping on opposite sides of the chain
because it had this big S turn and they had to do that uh, in, in order to keep, keep from having a wreck. And we've also got a picture of a wreck here that we want to show that shows that the very best in the bunch yeah. of the bunch, yeah. they can also make mistakes. Well, we've talked a great deal about this. And I, it's really interesting to me uh, what these guys were doing with 20 mule teams is truly amazing. It's not incredible. Um, I read some place just with uh, the 20 mule teams that they talk about with uh, the borax, you know, that they were running as many as six to eight teams back and forth every day. So there were 16 teams of these 20 mule teams running in a day. And I mean, these guys that were that were piloting this stuff, had, that, that's just amazing to me. And they were pretty highly well paid from what I understand. But I, I, I was just truly flabbergasted with the amount of the weight and the freight that these guys pulled. Uh, three of those wagons was over 70 tons, plus the weight of the wagon, which was seven or eight tons. It, just miraculous to me. But anyway, that gets us back to the Roosevelt Dam that we were talking about earlier and the Roosevelt Road, uh, which of course we know is Apache Trail, uh, which is an incredible, t uh, an incredible feat in itself. And unfortunately, as popular as that road got to be, as it stands right now, it's been closed for over a year because of a couple of rock falls. Um, it's an important road, uh, and it seems like we ought to be able to get that thing open somehow or another. Well, yeah, you're saying they were running 16 teams with these Borox places. You know, they were running anywhere from 20 to 60 wagons a day on Apache Trail. Mm. And we have a, we have a picture, a vid, we have a drone shot here. Uh, of what's left of the old Apache Trail, the only place really left of the old Apache Trail. And you, you talked earlier about that skinny little road. If you think that, if, how would you like to meet a team coming down while you're coming up on oh this road? Goodness. This this vid video is something else. And it uh, shows the old bridge abutment. The bridge is no longer there, but uh, the, the, the stonework is still there. And this is really the only place that you can see any of the original original Apache Trail to give you some idea of how narrow it was and what it must have been like to go around these corners. And also, the, you know, the teams coming back from the dam probably weren't carrying anything. So all other teams had right away. Well, sure. And but it was their responsibility, the empty ones, it was their responsibility to make sure that when they came to a curve or a downhill or something like that, to make very sure that, that there wasn't somebody coming up. If you have a team coming down and a team going up, how does one know that the other one's doing what it's doing because they, they don't have radios. We have radios today. <laughs> well, that's true, but the, the, the lead teams had a, a, an extension on their leather goods to, to, to hang bells off of. And you could, uh, these were good sized bells. These weren't little dinky things, and, uh, and you could hear them quite a distance. But just like you're going to be on the freeway doing uh, 70 miles an hour and you want to switch lanes, it's always best to have a visual. <laughs> yes, that can't hurt. <laughs> and not depend on somebody honking their horn. So I, I really suspect that uh, the empty teams did a visual before, because, mm -hmm. you know, this, this one drone shot we're showing is almost half a mile long, and I don't think you could hear those bills half a mile no. away. So you got to make darn sure there's nobody coming. Because what would you do on a skinny thing with a drop off like it if you met each other? Oh my goodness, we and talked about that wreck before. <laughs> I shudder to think what a wreck. Would be like I heard a guy tell me one time, I asked him about if there were any wrecks, and he says, yes, yes, there was. And, and you never get over hearing that sound of mules screaming as they're being drug over. Oh, it, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to see or hear any of that. I don't want no parts of but, that. But you know, the, uh, some of these Teamsters, uh, you know, with a 10 up or a 12 up, which was common, 
uh, would team together. And when they got to places like Fish Creek Hill, um, the back team would stop, unhitch their mules, and t attach them to the back of the lead wagon. So you had mules pulling them down hills, but you had mules behind Holding them dragging them back. them back. And uh, this, this was specifically to avoid having any wrecks. Now, in fact, uh, did, they, did they have 20 mule teams on Apache Trail? We, you know, we've got all kinds of pictures of 10s and 12s and stuff like that, but yes, actually there was a, there was a group as near as I can count had 24 teams. 24? 24. They were hauling a steam engine up to Roosevelt Dam. And uh, here's a picture of, of the tremendous long line of, uh, it looks like a mixture of an, uh, horses and mules, but that steam engine was big and it was heavy and, they, and it, it took a lot of pull to do that. Where were they taking the bloody thing? Well, he was taking it up to Roosevelt Dam. Well, but, uh, yeah, I guess he was. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, uh, Highway 88 is closed now because of the Woodbury fire and the uh, monsoon storms that caused a, a, a landslide that has blocked the road. And um, we're all very concerned, you know, in, in 1987, uh, State Route 88 was made into a scenic highway. And it, it is a very popular place, even, even Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, was amazed by the beauty and grandeur of, of Apache Trail. And all my relatives and friends that come out here, I take them to Fish Creek Hill. And of course, it's closed now. And my understanding was in the beginning, they said they weren't gonna open it. But the state has got some federal funds to, to, to make sure that happens. But I also hear that um, that they, they plan to wait until the vegetation regrows so they don't have to do it again real quick. But um, that doesn't make sense to me either because uh, every, every good monsoon season we have, the grass grows and when the summer comes it dies and it burns down again and then there's, there's been landslides before and there'll be more after. Realistically, I don't think most people understand not only the commercial value of the Apache Trail. I mean, it was it was really important back then getting to Roosevelt Dam. We know that, but in this day and age, uh, the commercial value of getting from uh, Apache Junction or down from the north into some of these tourist areas to see Tortilla Flat or whatever is really important. But it's also important in a lot of other ways uh, besides the commercial. There's the tourism, but there's also the importance that nobody thinks about of what this road does, because it cuts off. It's the hypotenuse in a triangle just for the police departments and the fire departments to get the places. And I know you've done research on that with a number of cars you, you told me what the number of cars were going through this, and it, it amazed even me. Well, yeah, in preparing for the museum, we had to show that, uh, that there was sufficient traffic to warrant sure. supporting a museum. And we got the ADOT statistics in 1980 when uh, they had traffic counters in two or three places on Apache Trail. And at one particular point, before you got to the museum, they had 21,000 cars a day going 21,000. 21,000 cars a day going through that counter. And uh, it also showed that 260 cars a day were going to Roosevelt Dam, the whole way, down Fish Creek Hill all the way to the Roosevelt Dam. The only other statistic I could find was, I, I looked it up on the internet just, just yesterday, in 2009, they estimated 
not from a counter, but they estimated that 16,000 cars a day were going up Apache Trail. And I, you don't know uh, where that cutoff was because there weren't three traffic counters because a lot of people, just as you pass museum, go over yeah, to where there's else, a lot of yeah. thousand people living over there. But anyway, uh, they said that 400 cars a day were going all the way through it in 2009. And um, so here it's another 12 years or so. And I have to assume that when Apache Trail closed because of the slide, that probably 600 cars a day were making it all the way through. And with, with uh, 88 closed at Fish Creek, you know, the, the, this closure and the fire uh, caused the people at Apache Lake, the marina, the restaurant, uh, uh, all the other stuff that goes on up there, uh, forced them to sell out. And I have it on good authority that, you know, it's 20 miles from Apache Lake uh, to Canyon Lake. Sure. And uh, the, for, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office is charged with patrolling Apache Lake. And now they can't go that 20 miles. They've got to go all the way around Up through Miami. Blown. Yeah, uh, and that's 110 miles, which means that's 220 miles every day. How many times? That uh, the <laughs> sheriff's office is having to go up to Apache Lake. And uh, although ADOT may uh, save some money by not opening up Apache Trail until until the vegetation grows back, which is going to burn down again, uh, the sheriff's office have to go bankrupt. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I just, I, I would love to see them go ahead and open it up because it isn't the first rock slide that's ever happened and it's not going to be the last. And uh, if, if, if nothing else happens between now and the next three and a half years before they think the vegetation is going to grow back, uh, what's going to happen to the economy up there at Apache Lake? Because, you know, once other people, once something closes down and you go find another place, it's hard to get, get them, them back. back. So we've seen the importance of what this trail really holds. And don't you find it pretty incredible that we can't get that fixed with everything we have today? When, when they built the thing, they had a, a bunch of guys out there with wooden shovels and picks and a bunch of jackasses, and they built the thing to start with. And now, all we got's a bunch of jackasses. <laughs> and that's just another, another mystery, mystery of the superstition, superstition mountain. <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.